Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So today we are going to look at uh, TIG welding some steel here. And uh, in this video I also kind of want to give a little more uh, discussion to technique on TIG welding and some of that sort of stuff. Uh, if you see my last video on aluminum, when we TIG welded some aluminum, I uh, felt like I didn't quite give a good enough explanation, so I'm going to hopefully rectify that here in this video. Anyway, don't forget you guys the safety equipment. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the machine settings, and then we'll go ahead and run a bead and show you what it all looks like. Alright, so here we are at the old Everlast. As you can see up there, I have my settings set to TIG, steel, and stainless. If I can get the camera focused, I don't know. Maybe it will. Probably not. So, on the Everlast machines, the way that this is set up is your TIG, steel, and stainless is your DC TIG, so direct current TIG. The TIG aluminum is your AC TIG. And on the... <clears throat> On the Everlast, the way that you get all that set up is down here in your leads. So you can see this one is labeled DC clamp, and this one is labeled AC clamp. So when I go to weld aluminum on AC, I need to remember to take, this is my ground lead, my ground clamp lead, I need to remember to take it from this port over to this one. And all that that really has to do is the way that they wire up the circuitry inside these machines. Personally, I kind of like, like it. I know it's a little, you know, it's a little awkward for a multi-process machine, but uh, I think it runs a lot cleaner that way, and you're not trying to shove so many circuits into one, into one outlet. Plus, on this, if I really wanted to, I could just go grab another clamp, and then I just have to remember what clamp I've got plugged into what. So anyway, that's kind of the story on the uh, on the Everlast side. Now. If some of you guys remember, Everlast kind of reads a little funky, so I'm not welding at 10 amps. If I hit the knob, it jumps. So I am welding, let's see, let's take a look here. So this is my welded material. So if I go with the rule of thumb, this is probably a little less than quarter. So rule of thumb, for those of you guys who haven't heard, the rule of thumb is you want one amp per every thousandth of thickness of welded material. So this is my welded material. It's a good 3 sixteenths. Doesn't quite feel or look like quarter. Yeah, I could be wrong on that, but anyway. So I'm probably gonna wanna weld this by rule of thumb standards somewhere up around 170-ish, 180-ish. Technically, quarter inch is 0.250 in thousandths, so I'd weld it at 250 amps. That's a little overkill on a DC current, uh, and I usually weld it a little bit lower on the amps when it comes to TIG welding, just because I have that full control and I don't have to be running along with a wire feeding or a stick burning off, so that's kind of how that works. Um, good little side note on that. You'll hear me talk a lot about welded material. So in a DC negative configuration, which is what you run your DC TIG in, your welded material is whatever piece of metal you're welding onto. In a DC positive configuration, like what you use for when you are stick welding, your welded material is the thickness of your stick. And that is just kind of a rule of thumb baseline on how to set your amps when you're welding with these different processes. So, TIG welding, DC negative, our welded thickness, our material thickness for our amperage rule of thumb setting is going to be the thickness of the material that you're welding. So, I'm going to go ahead, let's see. So I'm at 130. I'm gonna I'm gonna ballpark it at 150. It's probably gonna be a little cold, but as you'll learn with TIG welding, because you have that full manual control, you can spend more time getting your puddle in. So that's kind of an important thing. Remember, time equals heat. So the longer you stay on a part, the more heat you'll put into it. 
And on that note, let's go up to like 160, somewhere in there. And we'll give that a try. So, as you can see, I've got pedal control. I have a post flow of gas at seven seconds and a pre flow at one. So, when I hit the pedal, the first initial second is just going to be gas. This is to remove all of the oxygen from out of the way before I start welding. Um, so that's that. Uh, most of the rest of this you don't really need to worry about. And also on machine setup, when you are TIG welding, your shielding gas is argon. And it's argon for pretty much all TIG welding applications. So make sure that you have 100% argon. That'll do your steel, your stainless, and your aluminum, and just about anything else that you are going to be TIG welding. There are some specialty gas mixes out there, but uh, we aren't going to really cover those as, again, they are specialty. It's usually a specific field that uses those kind of gases or a specific process. I'm hoping not to get too specific in this in this channel. So anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click my pedal down here, get the torch away from anything. I'm going to click the pedal, and I'm going to look at my regulator and see where my where my CFH is. So click the pedal. There it goes, and my ball is right about at 20 maybe just a little bit under. So, for TIG welding, <clears throat> the base setting, if I can get that, so my regulator is measuring SCFH. I don't remember what the S is, um, but CFH stands for cubic feet per minute. So the S is probably square. Anyway, your TIGs are going to be measured in CFH. You want about 15 to 20 CFH, um, especially for a cup this size. Now, if I ever find the chance to get a gas lens, it's a little bit different. Gas lenses have more area to put gas through, so you need to raise your CFH. But if you're using just a regular TIG cup like this one, or a number seven that's not a gas lens, or a six, or a five or a four, just a regular gas lens, you're gonna want about 15 to 20 CFH. So that sh should do it for the machine setup. Let's go ahead and sit down and talk about technique and hopefully I can do a better example on technique. All right, so technique on TIG welding. First of all, I wanna show you here, hopefully I can get it to focus in the camera. You can kinda see but my tungsten here is sharpened down to a point. So when you're DC welding on steel or stainless, you want your tungsten at a sharp point, like so. Uh, you do not want to knock off the point when you're DC welding. We want all of that focus because the current in DC is only flowing one way. So uh, on DC negative, the current is going to go from the electrode into the workpiece and it's going to continue to flow that direction. Whereas in AC, you'd get the current going into the workpiece and then the polarity would flip and the current would come out of the workpiece and into the tungsten. Which is why you, when you AC weld, you put that little landing on there. So, DC welding, just leave it at a sharp point. Now, there's three main things to TIG welding. And I like to sit down when I'm TIG welding. First, you have your torch, okay? This is your heat source. This is where all your heat's going to come from. The second is you have your pedal. And obviously you can't see my pedal, and, but you have your pedal. Uh, pedal is the most common way for you to do your TIG welding is pedal control. There's also scratch start and lift arc. And we might cover lift arc in a different video, but for now we're just going to use the pedal. And the third thing is your welding rod. So, this here is a 16th inch steel welding rod. You will notice it is copper in color. The copper coloring is a deoxidizer that they put on the rod. So, 
you've got your argon shielding gas coming out of the torch to keep oxygen out, and you also have a deoxidizer on your rod to help clean the metal as you're going and give you good strong welds. Now, when I'm welding, I have the machine off so that I won't zap anything. I like to hold my torch about like this in a bit of a claw grip. It's just what's natural to me. If it feels better to hold it like this, go for it. You might be a little bit out here trying to weld with it, but it is an option. I like the claw because I can get it aimed downward a lot more comfortably, and it also helps me, you'll notice my arm is posted up on the edge here so that I can keep stability while I'm running. Now, your torch angle on this direction you're going to mostly be straight up and down on a flat piece like this here. So you're going to be pretty straight up and down with a bit of a lead angle. So hopefully you guys can see that. So this is straight up and down with a bit of a lead angle on it. And your rod, you want your rod to follow the direction that your torch is going to travel. <clears throat> a lot of this has to do with how you're filling. So when you arc out, you're going to put a dab of rod in there, and it's going to create a small mound of molten metal. And then you're going to push that mound to the next spot, and it's going to lower, and then you're going to build it back up. So this is a large reason why you want to stay in front of your puddle with your filler rod, is you want to stay in front of the mounds, the dimes, if you will, as you're stacking it up. Now, there are situations that I've run into where, due to the way that the part is situated and where I can get the torch into, sometimes I do have to run it backwards. It can be done, it's not the most pretty looking, and there is an argument that sometimes it's not as structural because you're not getting your rod directly into the puddle, but you can do it if you have to. But, best practice, Keep your rod in front of your torch, and you want to feed it in the direction of your torch. So whichever way I'm going, it's in front of the arc, in front of the puddle at all times. So that's a tech technique for you. Now, when it comes to the pedal, and again, unfortunately, this is hard for me to show you. I'll kind of simulate with my hand. So my pedal, I'm all the way off. When I'm going to start, and you're going to get some differing opinions on this, but the way that I like to do my pedal is I'll get set up and I like to gradually ramp my pedal up, very gradually. Um, this is especially good if you're new to this because if you just slam the pedal to full, there's a good chance if you're working on thinner material, you're going to blow through your material because you'll get all the amps that you set right off the bat as opposed to give it a gradual ramp up and then you can see what your puddle is doing and when you get a liquid pedal liquid pedal liquid puddle excuse me when you get a liquid puddle back off just a hair just a tiny hair because the idea is to get a puddle and maintain that puddle not constantly keep pushing the pedal down and making an even bigger puddle so, that's kind of the idea with the pedal, is for me, it's a ramp up, get it to a point where I can see a liquid puddle there, and back off just a hair. Now, the other fine adjustment with the pedal and the puddle, try saying that five times fast, <clears throat> is you need that puddle to move. So, when you get your puddle established, okay, and this is a bit of technique as well. Get your puddle established, make sure it's liquid, okay? Then add filler rod. So, puddle, liquid, filler rod. And then you have to move the puddle and then another filler rod. And then move the puddle and then more filler rod. A common mistake. Well, it might not be a mistake, but this makes things a lot easier when you're learning TIG. A lot of people will just arc out and they'll immediately put some filler rod in. 
that doesn't always guarantee good penetration. And a lot, there's a lot of times that a TIG weld will fail from that. So make sure that you push that puddle along, make sure that puddle is into the base metal, and then fill. So get your fusion and then fill. Fusion, then fill. Fusion, then fill. Okay? That will help alleviate uh, some of the problems that can happen during TIG welding, which usually comes down to just melting filler metal on top of the base metal and not getting any filler metal into the base metal. It's just sitting there in a puddle on top of the base metal. So hopefully that's a better technical um, explanation for TIG welding. And again, I say, lead your arc with your rod. Sometimes you're going to get into positions where you're going to have to, you know, move your rod in order to fully get into position. A lot of times with the camera here, sometimes I'll end up, you know, knocking into the tripod, if you guys can hear that. I'll end up hitting the tripod that the camera's on, so I would have to change my angle in order to get things. Other times that I will also end up changing my angle is, again, with the camera, if I keep it like this and it's in a direct line with the camera, you're not going to see much of a puddle. You're just going to see the filler rod as I'm going. So I might angle it so that you can get a better look at the puddle as I'm going. Those are just some uh, things that I might have to do. You might have to do as well on your projects, but that is a fairly technical explanation on what it takes to do TIG welding. Now, before we get into the welding, I do also want to mention there's a reason that people say TIG welding is the hardest to learn. It takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of coordination, and it takes a massive amount of hours of practice to really nail it down. So, if at first you are having difficulties, don't give up. I had difficulties, I had to TIG weld for about six months, a full half year before I really finally got it to lock in and felt really good about it. So, there's the explanation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw up the darkening lens on the camera, throw on my helmet and gloves, and you'll notice I've been wearing my sleeves. It's a little cold out here in the garage. So I'll get all of my safety gear on, and then we'll go ahead and run a bead on this. Alright, here we go. So again, I'm going to gradually ramp up the pedal. <clears throat> and get it to a liquid puddle, back off just a little bit, and then establish my puddle and get it to move. If the pedal, or the puddle, excuse me, if the puddle doesn't move with me, then I know that I need more pedal to get the puddle to move. Let me change that real quick. <clears throat> okay, try that one more time. Here we go. There we go. Okay, got a puddle. Fill it. Puddle's moving, fill it. Puddle's moving, fill it. Puddle's moving, fill it. Puddle's moving, fill it. And it's just that process the entire way. And just making sure that the puddle looks even all the way across. And gradually bring the pedal back down. Alrighty guys, there you go. That is a TIG weld. It's fairly well dimed. It doesn't look like it as much on uh, steel sometimes, but that is about what you're going for. Now you'll notice it's kind of gray and whatnot. Um, that's largely down to a heat dispersion and shielding issue. Um, I don't have a great big giant shielding cup on my torch, so there's only oh so much that I can shield. 
on that note, something that I kind of forgot to mention, so I'll mention it here. When I get done with my weld, I'll ease off the pedal, get the arc to shut off, and then hold the torch right where I finished. And this is to let the post flow get down around the end of the weld. Um, that is a very, very important part when you start welding stainless, is you need that post flow to help keep the hot stainless that you just welded from oxidizing. Now, um, I have a brush over here. And I'm going to clamp this down real quick so that it doesn't move on me while I brush it. So, it's got that kind of dull gray color. I'm going to brush it. And I just brushed a whole bunch of rust on it, didn't I? Let's see. Do, 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 do. What is that? Well, heat proof. All right. Well, it didn't really change, but it is a little bit more glossy after doing that. There's usually a small amount of oxides on top of your metal when you get stopped, especially if you've got a small gas lens like that, or if you don't have a gas lens, I should say. That's not even a gas lens, that's just a small cup. Uh, so gas lenses definitely help with the look uh, going forward, but most of the time you can just brush it and it'll look fine. So anyway, so anyway, there you go. That is TIG welding still. Hope you guys learned something. Um, probably going to be taking a break on the channel. Uh, the Christmas season is coming up this next week. So I'm probably going to be taking a break, spend some time with family. And I've kind of got to decide what I'm going to do with the channel uh, moving forward. So I'm probably, hopefully, going to be swapping out some gas pretty soon. And hopefully we'll have some MIG welding videos coming. But that's a little dependent on my finances currently. So, anyway, hopefully we'll be back soon, and we'll catch you guys in the next one.